Hi everybody and welcome to the shed where basically we just play around with stuff. Hi everybody, so solar cells are pretty remarkable things. I mean not at the beginning of course, when you're looking at things like copper oxide cells, their efficiency was well pants in the region of sort of 4%. But of course with the advent of silicon and with improvements in manufacturing, quality of materials, stability of the crystal structure, you're getting 18 to 22% efficiencies which are quite remarkable and of course enter the perovskites which are showing sort of 25%. They have issues with their stability but of course research is ongoing. But at the top of the solar you're looking at things like tandem cells where they're layering up materials to capture different parts of the light spectrum and in research conditions they're approaching 30% efficiency which is astounding when you think that the solar cell limit is fixed by the Schottky barrier which is around about 33.7% as being the limit of the efficiency of a solar cell and they're quickly approaching that limit which is astounding when you think about it. But of course as a product a solar cell is just one part of energy storage. You've got the cell itself and of course you've got all the structure, the cables, the actual way of charging a battery and storing that in a battery and that part can be very much more expensive than just the solar cells themselves. So it would be great if there's a way that solar could be its own battery and recharge itself and unsurprisingly research is ongoing into that very area. It quite possibly began with this paper. What these guys discovered was that if you take a blueprint which is something that all technical drawings were at one time and leave it it'll go white. <laughs> That doesn't sound astounding until you connect it up to a couple of electrodes and it will give that energy back out. The energy it took to make it white will give and be given back out to do work and it will go back to blue. So they constructed a solar cell out of this to test that effect to see whether the sun's energy could do that and store that energy until you wanted to use it. So effectively a solar cell stroke battery that charges itself in the sun. Then that material is called Prussian blue and Prussian blue is stunningly easy to make all by yourself and it's completely innocuous. To make Prussian blue we need one of two things okay so here we have some potassium ferrocyanide which is the K4 version and for that we need an iron 3 salt like iron chloride so there's that way. Then there's this one which is the potassium ferricyanide which is the K3 version and for that we need an iron 2 salt like iron sulphide. This is a fertilizer incidentally. We're going to use that one because actually it's much cheaper than this one. Now if we make up some solutions, there is my potassium uh, ferricyanide, there is my sulphate and this is a 3 molar solution of potassium chloride which we're going to use as the electrolyte. And to make this what we're going to use is some coffee filters. Now I've cut the filters into little strips like this because to be honest this bit is almost magical. The first thing you do is dip it in there and dry it. But let me give you a close up of some of this because I just love it. Okay step one dip it in the ferricyanide, the yellow solution, and just let it soak into the filter paper and you get this beautiful yellow paper. Now we dry that. Once we've dried it, that's what we get. <laughs> this is the beautiful bit. And dip it in there, it's going to go bright blue um, immediately. Now there's an excess of iron in here because we're not after the colloidal version, we're after the insoluble version. So here we've got one molar, here we've got an excess of it, it's two molar actually. And if we dip it in there, Look at that, isn't that beautiful? It immediately goes this deep blue colour and that is Prussian blue. And of course once we've done that we dry it and we get that which is Prussian blue paper. Now this is insoluble, completely harmless, what, nothing will happen to it and this is how they made blueprints. We're going to use that as the base of our battery. So I've got myself a bit of aluminium and I've stuck it on this big bit of plastic so basically I can cart it around without having to worry about it. We put a separator paper on the aluminium and then we soak that separator paper with our potassium chloride solution. We 
take our Prussian blue and put that on top. So on the other side, what I've got is a bit of stainless steel mesh. Now it's not brilliant, but it is better than nothing because it has see-throughness to it. But if we put that on there, what we'll get is a voltage. There we go. I'm gonna put it on voltage. Okay, so it starts off about 0.8 of a volt on this particular thing, and as that discharges, then that Prussian blue will go white. Now, it doesn't need the sun at this stage, so I've stacked a lot of weights on it just to make sure we get good contact, and I've put a supercapacitor on, and you can see there the voltage rising, because I'm reading the voltage across, across this supercapacitor, which means this little cell is now charging that supercapacitor. And it's doing that because the aluminium is assisting with the oxidation of the Prussian blue, to Prussian white. So after some time that has bleached. Now it was ages and it gave out a low slow amount of power for that whole time. Now all we've got to do is put it into the sun and it'll go blue again. So we're back to this. This is a long slow process. Eh? We left that in the sun and it's gone blue like a blueprint would and we're now ready to reconnect it and we'll get it to discharge again. So I noticed I left the backlight on on the meter. I'm sorry about that. I'll make sure that I don't do that again. But you can either take my word for it or repeat the experiment or read the research paper. And I'll put the link to the research papers, two of them actually, in the description below. And um, they are open access. So anybody can read them if they want to and replicate exactly what I did. Now it's an exciting field because although it's still, like everything, has its issues, which is why it's still in research, it is coming along leaps and bounds and it found its birth in um, chromic windows, electrochromic windows, but it is also being developed as a battery technology. So we live on a planet that is 71% covered in water, and yet water scarcity and water shortages are a huge issue for us. And that's because life on planet Earth, or rather the Earth part of planet Earth, can't cope with salty water, and most of our water is salty. It's only about 3% that's fresh. Of that, most of it's locked up in things like ice caps, and only 1.2% is left for us to drink. Of course, that water comes from somewhere and it all comes from the sea. It's a natural process called the water cycle. Basically, the sun hits the surface of the sea, evaporates the water, condenses into clouds, falls as rain, creating rivers and lakes that flow back to the sea. There is in fact, at any one time, more fresh water in the air than there is in all the rivers and lakes put together. Six times as much, in fact. So to get more water, there is essentially two things we can do. We can either look at alternative resources, that is, try to pull that water out of the air, or we can look back to the sea and try to remove the salt from the sea. And of course, that process is known as desalination. Now, desalination is essentially very simple. You take some salt water, input some energy, and separate the salt and the water. And there are a surprising number of ways of doing that. Unfortunately, they all have the same issue, and that is the energy cost of doing it. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to remove salt from water. But technically, it is simple. It can be as simple as digging a hole in the ground with a cup in the bottom. Or you can replace that with a bowl with the seawater at the bottom of your bowl. And what happens is the sun's rays heat up the water, causing it to evaporate. And when it hits a bit of plastic, of course, it condenses. Because there's a rock in the middle, that condensed water rolls to the centre and drips into the cup. That simple system has a lot to commend it. I mean, it's super simple, it's really cheap, it's very effective, and it still needs a lot of energy, but it gets that energy directly from the sun, because it has its problems. It takes forever. I mean, it's about eight hours and you get half a cup of water, and if you were to try to do that for everybody, you'd need seven Earths all wrapped in plastic. So it's not particularly adaptable to a large scale, but the attractiveness of a simple system like that leads us to think of how we would actually improve it. Now, what it is, is, is this idea that if you try to heat a bulk of water directly from the sun, of course you've got a massive bulk, you've got to raise the temperature of that, it takes ages, and then you start to get evaporation, and sometimes that can take all day, so by the time it's evaporating you've gone into the night and everything's cooling down. 
And then there's the idea that if you can separate those layers so that instead of trying to heat the bulk of water, all you're trying to heat is a tiny fraction of that water that you're separating from the bulk, it should be much more efficient. I don't know if you've ever met this stuff. It's Oasis Foam. And this is amazing stuff. It's uh, supposed to mimic the plant cell. And if I pop that into water, it will wick the water up like that far. It really sucks the water into it and keeps that water, which is um, an awesome thing when you think about it. Now, of course, if we do that and direct the sun on here, it's maybe going to get warm. But I have this as well, which is a black carbon felt. This is an activated carbon felt, actually. And my thought is, if we get that bulk of water and we stick in the oasis, and then we lay some felt on top of it, the sun will heat the black, because it's black, the oasis will wick the water into the carbon, and we should get a more efficient and faster rate of evaporation. Here's our oasis with our black carbon felt on it. Uh, here's our bowl with nothing in. This is uh, two kilos of water, so two litres, exactly the same here, two litres of water. Let's set them outside in the sun. Set a timer going and then every hour go and take a weight measurement. This is the setup and it's pretty simple stuff. All I've really done is put these two bowls of water out on a wall in the sun and the wind. And um, this one is actually responding about 50% better than this one. So this is evaporating a hell of a lot quicker than this is evaporating. Now it's pretty cool that covering something with a bit of blank felt can have such a dramatic improvement, but of course like every solution, it brings a whole set of other problems because as it's busily evaporating that water, it's leaving the salt behind. And so that felt become clogged with salt. And that's the big problem with a lot of these kind of solar evaporation systems. Or rather, has been until MIT came out with this paper this year. It uses something called thermohaline circulation. It's a circulation method that happens in the oceans. Now, basically, when water gets hot, it gets less dense. And when water has a lot of salt in, it gets more dense. So the salty water has a propensity for sinking down to the bottom and the hotter fresh water rises to the top. And you can see this in a dye colored water where you've got normal water and salt water. You can see how quickly the dye is separated. What well, that means is this whole system doesn't become clogged up with salt. The salt is contained in the brine, circulates through the system, and is discharged before it gets too salty. The researchers reckon that half a square meter can produce sort of four to six liters per hour of fresh water. What it means is that the first time ever, it's possible to use a simple solar still to produce drinking water that is actually cheaper than the tap water that is supplied in the average household. Because it doesn't clog up, it's going to be years before a still like that actually needs replacement parts. So if we have a bit of a better look at the structure of it, we can see it's actually pretty straightforward and could be reproduced using oasis foam and carbon felt like we did in the earlier experiment. And it's exactly the kind of engineering that I love. It's simple, it's straightforward, it's inexpensive both to make and maintain, and it's a very clever use of a natural principle. The paper, incidentally, is open access, and I've put a link to it down in the description should everyone have a read of it and maybe give it a go at replicating it. I suppose when we think of plants, several things come to mind. We could think of them as food, we can think of them as decoration, we could think of them as a natural world, we can think of them as great sinks for carbon dioxide, and we can think of them as a massive oxygen producer. But thinking of them as electrical generators is, is perhaps a little harder to imagine. However, turns out that's exactly what they are, and we can harness the energy directly from plants. Now that might seem a little ludicrous, but there are in fact three main ways to do this. And one way we've already covered quite a lot in detail, making bio-based solar cells and bio-based batteries. The basic idea is the conversion of light energy into electrical energy using photosynthesis is possible. 
Of course, in a sense, this is a solar cell with the added advantage if it cleans itself, it repairs itself, and if it goes really, really well, it increases itself. So it's no real surprise that the next step in fuel cells is to use that process of photosynthesis. If the photosynthesis allows the plant to grow, it gives out waste products, and it's actually the microorganisms at the roots of the plants that are responsible for the production of electricity in the same way as a microbial fuel cell. Now, as they produce the electrons and the electricity, of course, carbon dioxide is produced. But then the plants are using up the carbon dioxide, which makes the whole thing net neutral. But essentially, it is a microbial fuel cell, but using photosynthesis. It doesn't matter which plant is being used, it's essentially the same process and walls of mosses have been built and they've put together a table of how much moss would be needed to generate how much power and small scale devices have been built like a coffee table and a clock to demonstrate the principles. Of course that's not strictly using the plant to generate electricity, it's actually using the interaction of the plant with the microbes in the soil which cause ion movement and that interaction between the plant and the soil is where the electricity is generated. However, a paper came out in 2022 where the plant itself was used to generate. The problem with the previous method was that the microbes need constant feeding, but in this paper what they were trying to do was directly access photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis is where sunlight falls on the leaves and it drives a flow of electrons from the water, resulting in the generation of oxygen and sugar, and that means that photosynthetic plant cells are constantly producing electricity that can be transported to power an external circuit, and that was the effort here. Now earlier what they'd done was put copper and zinc electrodes into things like trees, and to be honest that was nothing more than a glorified lemon battery. But here what they're doing is accessing the internal material of the cell directly and using it as an electrolyte with the covering of the cell actually making a micro battery. Using a specimen of a Corpuscularia lemani, scientists were able to create living solar cells by using platinum and iron electrodes. The team designed the experiment so that the protons within the leaf's internal solution could combine to form hydrogen gas at the cathode, and this hydrogen could also be collected and used in other applications. Now, a single leaf was capable of producing voltages of 0.28 volts, and connected to a circuit, it generated 20 microamps per cubic centimetre of current. If exposed to light, the leaf is capable of continuously producing current, just like a true living photocell. OK, the numbers are much lower than with, say, an alkali battery, but of course what we're talking about here is a single leaf, and of course that can be connected in series or parallel. Finally, there is another source of power from plants, and that is transpiration. Transpiration is driven by evaporation from the leaves, and what happens is it causes water to be drawn up and through the plant, which carries ions with it. And this ion transport, or movement of ions across a surface, can generate electricity. Unlike previous methodologies, which really involved sticking the electrodes directly into the plant or the plant's roots, transpiration can be extracted as a process and an individual device can be made using the effect of transpiration, but not necessarily using the plant that it's linked with. And it turns out that when water is transpired through a structure, it'll generate a considerable amount. And this paper came out this month, about two weeks ago, where they detail a fabric method. It's essentially a piece of fabric with two carbon electrodes and you wet the piece of fabric and as the water moves across that piece of fabric it generates electricity. And it is a considerable amount. They've constructed a tent out of this and managed to charge a mobile phone using a tent structure covered in transpiration elements. And of course on the channel we've done different batteries in earlier videos using exactly the same effect demonstrating how to make these kinds of devices. So these tiny power plants 
Doing things like charging mobile phones certainly represent a whole new way of looking at power plants and how we're going to generate electricity for the things that we need. It's still ongoing obviously, but there are huge leaps and bounds being made in these fields and with luck we'll certainly see some more very interesting, more powerful devices coming out where we won't need to rely quite so heavily on traditional methods. So this stuff, aluminium, it's an amazing material, it truly is. I mean, we're a bit blasé about it because we use it for stuff like this, cooking foil and um, drink cans. We're so used to it, we probably don't think about it much, but it was actually only discovered in the mid 19th century by Hans Christian Ersted, who separated it from alum, which is incidentally where it gets its name from, using mercury salts. And it was so expensive when it was first found that it was used as jewelry. Napoleon had a set of cutlery that he used to take with him on campaign made of aluminium just to impress everybody. These days of course we mass manufacture it using electrolysis and it's made in the megaton. It's one of the cheapest metals there is. Aluminium is about a dollar a pound as is zinc, copper is about three dollars a pound and lithium somewhere like twenty six dollars a pound. So it's one of the cheapest metals, it's one of the most used and it's one of the most abundant and the price of aluminium of course is um, really factors in the energy cost of producing it. So when people say it's a bit expensive and energy intensive, well yes it is, but then lots of things are and the price is already factored in the price of the aluminium. It's so cheap because we produce so much of it and it's usually produced pretty near where the electricity supply is also produced, like at nuclear power plants and hydroelectric dams. But the fact remains, it is an astonishing material and it's one of those metals that is incredibly reactive. We don't really appreciate it because it's so reactive it almost immediately forms an aluminium oxide coat over the top of it which is unreactive and that protects the rest of the metal. But if you can remove the uh, oxide coat of course it's very dramatic and I'm sure everybody's seen this where you put a piece of aluminium in some sodium hydroxide and say hey look the sodium hydroxide is attacking the aluminium. Well sort of what it's actually doing is attacking the aluminium oxide coating and that strips it bare so the aluminium can react with the water and of course as it reacts with the water what it does is gives off a tremendous amount of heat and more interestingly a tremendous amount of hydrogen because aluminium reacts with water to form hydrogen. Not only do we get the production of the chemicals there and the hydrogen that we might want in order to burn something off, there is also a current formed and heat. Now let me demonstrate that current to you. Okay, so what I've got here is a stainless steel pot with the same potassium hydroxide solution in it and a little piece of aluminium. The aluminium is clipped to a motor and the other side of the pot is clipped to the motor as well. So the two electrodes are the sides of the pot and the aluminium. Now if I dip that aluminium in my potassium hydroxide solution and give that a chance to get going, there we go. We are now producing electrical energy and it produces a fair amount of power actually depending on the amount of surface area of aluminium that's exposed, the thickness of aluminium will give its duration and of course the surface area of the corresponding electrode. Now at the same time as producing that electrical energy it's also producing the hydrogen and it produces a considerable amount of heat. Of course sodium hydroxide isn't the only thing that will do that. Acids will do it as Ersted found mercury will do it though. <laughs> Not many people want to muck around with mercury these days and gallium will also do it and putting an electric charge to blow the oxide off the surface will all do it and they all do the same thing. They get rid of the oxide coating so the aluminium is nice and bare and the water can reach it and react with it. And of course that's of huge interest because when the water reacts with the aluminium to form aluminium oxide it also releases hydrogen and hydrogen is what everybody's after. Aluminium can form the basis of a hydrogen on demand system. Now if I were able to do that and I just burnt the hydrogen in a normal internal combustion engine, took a 350 mile round trip, it would cost me more or less $60 in the price of the aluminium at 
current metals prices. If I had to do that using a normal fuel, then here in the UK, that would cost me in the region of $56 to take exactly the same trip. Now, of course, there would be differences because aluminium isn't as energy dense as fuel. So the aluminium would weigh more, about the same as another passenger. So nowhere near what an electric car battery would cost, but it would take up about the same space as the fuel tank in order to do that journey. Of course, as I said, we fed this straight into an internal combustion engine, and internal combustion engines at the best are around about 30-35% efficient on current road cars. If we changed and used a fuel cell, well, fuel cells are sort of between 40 and 60% efficient, with expectations of them getting up to 80% efficient. And we also said we just burnt the hydrogen, we threw away the electricity that generates, which is not inconsiderable, and the heat that it generates. All of this is why the drive to hydrogen is so attractive to people. What's holding it back are the problems with generating hydrogen currently, which is done through cracking hydrocarbons, and then the storage and transportation of hydrogen and using the hydrogen on board because it has to be pressurised and cooled. And of course, hydrogen has a terrible habit of exploding as things like the Hindenburg disaster show us. And that's why hydrogen on demand systems, that is where you generate the hydrogen in the car, are so attractive because they solve so many problems. That is the generation, transportation, storage and refueling of a hydrogen car. And it brings a hydrogen vehicle very much nearer to a cheap and cost effective realisation. Now, there are a few ways of doing this, that is, creating a hydrogen on demand system, but there are two really interesting ways that I'm aware of. The first one's very well known, and the second one, for some reason, is almost completely forgotten. Now, the first one uses that gallium aluminium interaction that we looked at earlier in this video, and I think the first paper on this came out in something like 1976, but it was picked up by Purdue University and brought out in 2007 as a very serious proposal and they actually formed a company called Algal Co to push this technology forward. As far as I know, the company actually didn't do that much with it and it's still kind of lurking in the background. And finally, it was picked up by Santa Cruz University in California in 2022 when they proposed the same system but using nanoparticles of the same alloy. Now the beauty of it is the gallium isn't actually used up. You can reclaim the gallium and reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. It's only the aluminium and the water that are used up. The second way relies on a patent by a chap called Francois Corniche. This was actually tested by BMW in 1981 and found to work exactly as the inventor said it would from a 14 volt supply. Now, for some reason after that, the whole thing lapsed. The patent was unpaid, and of course it's now out of date. And the inventor, well, he disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, conspiracy theorists will love this one, I'm for sure. My thoughts about it are a little more prosaic. It is tremendously difficult to get a patent into production. People think you have a patent, it's a doorway to millions. It's not. 95% of patents never see the light of day. And the 5% that do, getting from prototype to market is such an uphill struggle, the bulk of patents never appear for really simple prosaic reasons not a conspiracy. However, there was one attempt at a replication as far as I know of, and that was in South Africa, where the device was built exactly in accordance with the patent specifications, and again was supposed to be shown to work. And it's a very simple device. It's a coil of aluminium wire that's fed into a water tank at a steady rate. The high voltage is then passed down it, which causes the end to spark off, exposing the aluminium. And the aluminium then reacts with the water, delivering hydrogen and aluminium oxide as the waste product at the bottom. Of course, aluminium oxide is what the refiners use to make aluminium, so you can ship that right back to the refinery. Now, it's a truly inventive system that I think deserves a great deal more looking at. 
Of course, all of this has got everybody very much more excited and it's become an intense area of research over the past couple of years, with different alloys being suggested, including indium and tin and even bismuth, to create alloys with exactly the same effect. And just this month, a new paper came out where the aluminium is being activated by the addition of nitrogen that is showing an improvement over previous systems. Now, to a degree, of course, it's arguable whether this is an aluminium energy source or a water energy source, because the water also gets used up to produce the hydrogen. Whichever it is, though, it does bring the whole idea of a hydrogen car very much closer, and it's very exciting. But I don't think we should lose sight of the patent that we looked at here. That could well be a way forward for people investigating their own systems. So, if you think about gears, then who thinks about gears? What you're really thinking about is motion, because gears are there to control motion. And you only really have, surprisingly enough, three elements. There is rotation, there is sliding or translation, and you can add those two together to get rotation and translation at the same time, which is, of course, exactly what a screw is. But then gears don't operate in isolation. They actually go into a machine and a framework and they're held in relation to each other. Because there, again, there are only really three ways to hold them into relation with each other. And here, where the gears lie on a plane, the axles are parallel to each other. They're like that. And if we have them in a plane, of course, we translate that motion across that plane. So if I turn that gear, what it does is turn that gear, and that turns that pinion operating what is a Geneva mechanism, and these were used in film cameras for nice accurate control of a stop and a move. But we don't have to have them just like that. We can take those axles, and we can put them at an angle to each other. Because if we put them at an angle to each other, we'll also angle the planes that they're sitting in. And this is an example of that, which is a bevel gear. So here the planes are meeting at some point, and then obviously the axles are bent at whatever angle that is. This is 90 degrees, but it can be any angle. And what that does, of course, is moves the motion from one plane to another plane at a set angle, and we get that. And these, of course, are used in car differentials, that sort of thing, all the time. The other way, of course, is where they're skewed from each other and they don't have a plane resistance, and that's something like this. And this is a worm gear. It's actually a one-to-one -one worm gear, so if I turn that, but that turns at the same speed. You might be more used to seeing a worm gear where you get a speed differential, but worm gears are an example of where the planes are skewed from each other. Now, these three examples, of course, are all examples of rotation, but we did say that there was a different kind, and that is translation. And one of my favourite examples of a rotation and translation is this. It's called the mangle gear. The mangle gear is like a rack and pinion, and great for moving something backwards and forwards. Like that. <laughs> this is actually one of my favourite gear mechanisms, in fact. So those six principles are what gears are all about. We've got three principles governing the motion, which is rotation, sliding or translation, and screw. And we've also got three frames of reference, either in the plane, at an angle so they meet in front of the gears, or skewed to each other. And that's it. And of course, that has led to the gears that we know, which we mostly think about as being circular gears. They might be bigger, they might be smaller, but essentially that's what they are, little circles covered in jagged teeth. But if you think about what we've just talked about, then that doesn't need to be a limitation on what gears are. And for some people, that certainly isn't a limitation. And there are some weird and wonderful gears and gear mechanisms out there. This is a cube gear, which is essentially a set of bevel gears, eight bevel gears where the axles meet in the centre of the cube. Perhaps the earliest example of this was by Emmett Lalish. Emmett's also created something called the heart gear, which is pretty much the same principle. A further development of this, following an octahedron rather than a cube, is the brain gear. Here, instead of truncating the bevel gears, the bevel gears are left in place. Now, unfortunately, these are wonderful designs, but I can't think of any practical use for them apart from being a good desk toy. 
Instead of being totally round, Nautilus gears take their cue from the Fibonacci spiral. The result is that at the very end of the rotation, the two big flat sides hit against each other before the next turn starts. It's another mostly pointless exercise, but these gears do exhibit an interesting quality. If one gear is moving at constant speed, the other will speed up and slow down during the course of its rotation. That's got to be good for something, yeah? Oval gears like these do have a practical use in devices like mechanical flow meters. The way the two gears intersect into a T-shape creates two distinct pockets of space. If the gears fit well enough together, these pockets can be completely watertight, so that when the liquid passes through the flow meter, you can use the volume of the pockets the gears create, combined with the number of rotations to calculate the volume of the liquid that passed through the device, and it can be incredibly accurate. These weird half-sphere gears are the work of Oscar van Deventer. He's a prolific YouTuber who designs a ton of strange gear mechanisms, basically just for the fun of it and for the puzzle of it. While Oscar's little invention here is basically a bit of a goof, it does have the interesting capability to fold 180 degrees like a hinge, while the gears stay interlocked and spin on a perpendicular axis. Oscar describes it as a solution in search of a problem, but it's still pretty cool. The Venix gear is a cross-spherical monopole gear designed by Yamagata University that has a range of motion throughout the sphere. It stands for Active Ball Joint Mechanism with 3 degrees of freedom. It's been used in robotics and is truly awesome. There are several STL files available on Thingiverse for anybody who wants to try this. The mangle rack is a set of pins that a gear moves around to control the movement of an object that the pins are attached to. And it was used with great effect by the Akiyuki Brick channel to build some wonderful LEGO models that are well worth checking out. Another really interesting mechanism with no real application is the trio of interlocking pieces in a rectangular version of a mathematical phenomenon called Borromean rings. It's a sequence of three identical gears that can move when they're all connected, which isn't usually the case. It's a fun little curiosity, but I don't really see that they serve a purpose other than just being fun to fiddle with. The final one I want to show you is another one from Henry Segerman. Henry is a mathematician and artist, and he does quite a lot of this stuff. It's yet another piece of art, but this system of gears includes three inseparable interconnected donut shapes, all powered by a single corkscrew spindle that juts up to the centre of the whole thing. It's not a lot of practical use, but it is a fun little desk ornament, and it is a pretty awesome gear set. So I only picked 10, but I could have gone on for ages because there are so many and I tried to get a selection of gears that I thought were fun, interesting and useful. And I'm sure 
that people have their own favourites that I don't know about. So if there's something that you think that I should know about or something you want everybody else to know about, leave a comment and that will allow me to have a look into that and see what else is out there. Now, all of the stuff that I've covered, I've put links to the credits and where it came from in the description. So if you're interested in anything that you've seen and you want to follow it up, just go to the description. The link is right there. Click on it and it can carry you through, including to some STL files if you want to print these out yourself. Power transmission is fundamental to our everyday life. It's so fundamental that basically we forget all about it. And if we think about it at all, then we think of power transmission lines and electricity. But power transmission is a process required for every piece of machinery, from tiny motors in pop-up selfie cameras to things like the transmission lines of the Large Hadron Collider. Power transmission applications are around us all of the time and we use power transmission applications to move power from a prime mover to the machinery that's going to perform its function and there are four main types of power transmission electrical we're really used to hydraulic of course pneumatic air and mechanical mechanical power transmission is that transfer of mechanical energy that's physical motion from one component to another in machines and most machines need some form of power transmission Common examples include things like electric shavers, water pumps, water wheels, turbines, cars, and in most cases, the rotational movement of the prime mover is converted into another rotational movement of the driven machinery. However, quite often the speed, torque and direction may well need changing. And every now and then the rotational movement needs to be changed into a back and forth movement or a translation depending on the requirements, for example a reciprocating saw. Surprisingly enough there are only six types of power transmission in machinery. The five common ones are shaft couplings, chain drives, gear drives, belt drives and power screws or lead screws. And the one that's not often thought of as a drive but more as a mechanism is the coulisse mechanism. Actually it's just French for slide and it's any slide mechanism that can be used to drive is a coulisse drive. And it's found as both a linear and a spherical form. And as a drive, it comes up time and time again in research papers as being more efficient than other more traditional forms that are thought of as a drive. Now, we have met this before in a previous video when we constructed the Hobson linkage. The Hobson linkage is, in fact, an example of a Cooley's drive. If you turn one of these, <laughs> there you go, you'll notice that they're both turning in the same direction. And although these are fixed, they're able to transmit that through 90 degrees. But the really funky thing is when I put a drill on. The Hobson coupler is a very interesting device for connecting two axles at 90 degrees so they rotate in the same direction. But it is also a springboard for an awful lot of other things. One thing you can do with it is make an engine out of it and an engine's been made called the elbow engine. Of course, you could immediately see how you could turn that into a solenoid engine or equally reverse that and make it a kind of generator. So of itself, an interesting and versatile joint that's used in things like angled tools for reaching hard to reach places. But there's another coulisse mechanism I'd like to introduce you to and that's a spherical coulisse drive. Now I got this from Thang010146 and he's an awesome guy. He's got more than 3,800 mechanisms on his channel and he includes the CAD files as step files that you can open in OpenShot. I didn't particularly like this design so I redrew it in Tinkercad like this and of course I will put these files in Thingiverse should anybody want to actually download them and this is a 3D printable version that just clips together. And when you've printed it off, that's what you get. Now there are only seven parts. I have included a 10 millimeter ball, but you're better off getting yourself a 10 millimeter ball bearing. But if you don't want to do that, there's a 10 millimeter ball in the file. To put it together, I mean, it's dead simple. That, which is the crank arm, goes in there first, and then you put a clip in there to hold the crank arm in place. When the crank arm's in place, you put a clip onto there and drop it into there like that. This goes onto there like that. It's the interfacing gear and you need a spot of glue on it just to hold it in place. 
and then the ball bearing slots between that and that and squeeze it in there there we go now it only works in one direction it only works if you turn that if you turn that it'll just spin round and round but if you turn that then this happens Okay, that's very cool. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. Now it's a two to one ratio, which means for two turns of that, we get one full turn of that. And so of course, we're going to get twice the torque on the output, which is right there. Now I'm not sure what to use this for because it's really for me an alternative drive system to have a look at but I do know that these have been used and the reports on them are pretty good in terms of their power transfer, but there we go a sliding non-gear power transfer that I don't think is looked at nearly enough. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.